Okay. Uh, yeah. I'd like to dig up the Linus quote and the Theo quote. Yeah, I'll get to that. Thank you for the reminders because there are actually some slides that didn't make it as well. I've only had about 24 hours to prep for this. But <laughs> Anyhow. Welcome, Phil. So do you have a little cute uh, mascot? Yes, the Damon. And oh, yeah. Beastie. Beastie. And that's mildly controversial in 2016 where everyone wants to be politically correct, so <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> so, hello, welcome. My name is Michael, and welcome to The Devil in the Detail, switching to BFD from GNU Linux. If you look at the title, it does not include the GNU in GNU Linux. It should probably be there. And it does broadly refer to BSD, which can mean a whole lot of things. So I'll be pretty specific in this talk. I am not. Larry Caffiero, I'm Michael Dexter. He could not make it to this event, and I opted to fill in, and I hope you enjoy it. You can find me online at Twitter with Michael Dexter, and there's my email address. So, some of the what. I personally have been involved in BSD Unix as a student in college. Out of dumb luck, they sat me down for CS 101 at a 4.3 BSD system. The administrator thinks, from his recollection, and coming from Hollywood, it's like, okay, I had a little my Mac, which was kind of a pretty beefy machine back in the day. And I thought, thought, wow, this is like behind the scenes, behind the facade. That's how the computer works. So I clicked immediately onto the whole Unix thing. And can anyone tell me what's special about January of 91? It was several months before the arrival of Linux. So there was... Unix. There was maybe IBM AIX by then. There was HPUX. There was Sun OS. There was Ultrix. There was this whole different era when there were competing vendors with their own Unix derivatives, all licensed and typically dedicated hardware that only ran that OS. And, and a key point, you couldn't afford to have it in your dorm room. So I would have been much better at this. I would have had a dot com if I could stand working in the windowless bunker of a CS lab in front of a terminal, which I hated. So I've been involved in various BSD projects very actively since 2003. You can go to BSD LV and see some of the things I've done there, with, especially with my colleague Christops. <coughs> I'm quite proud of his work on Mandoc, which is a replacement for Groff. And Groff is a big complex thing for formatting man pages. And Everyone hated it, but that's how you did it. Everyone did it that way. That's what you use. But he thought, well, if you interpret the man page like macros, and then it gets put into a lower level, what if you just stayed at the top there? And what he produced was something lightweight to do that ancient task, and it's become pretty much a standard manual formatter on all modern systems, including many Linux distributions. So it's often great to just step back and look at a problem and think about it. So I'm proud of the work there. We've done various virtualization projects, both he and I, and on my own. And on virtualization, I've been very involved with the Beehive hypervisor on FreeBSD. I was user zero. The developers had a presentation and said, hey, we're working on this, which came directly out of an unconference. And I've been focusing on virtualization for a long time. And I thought, that's great. And I approached them. And they're like, oh, wow, someone approached us. And the rest is history. <coughs> I've also been very active with FreeNAS for about four years now. And that will come up in the talk. So in practice, I run OpenBSD 24-7 on my web server. And my phone runs GNU Linux on Android. And OK. And with all the hypervisors and goodies, I've done a, most of my, my development is in FreeBSD. I love Unix. <laughs> Classic, old school, and there are various quotations go with it, like, it takes a genius to appreciate the simplicity <laughs> of Unix. <laughs> so yeah, specifically BSD, Berkeley Software Distribution, which came out of UC Berkeley. So classic Unix came out of AT&T in the dark ages. Thompson, Ritchie, you name it, Kernahan, who did brilliant things. I suggest you check out that history. They had very, very limited resources in hardware, financially, in memory, and they did things like convince the legal department that they needed some system that could do, say, legal document formatting. So 
the graph I mentioned was a pretty early <laughs> technology graph back then and all that stack just to get this out there because they saw something the rest of us didn't see. You know, I wasn't born yet, but very smart people. I believe it was Ken Thompson who did a sabbatical at Berkeley, and I'll check with uh, various folks about the exact lineage of how he may have infected the organization, but uh, fast forward at, I think it was 1980, the Defense DARPA, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Program, I think, Park administration, Day. approached them and said, hey, we want a standard operating system for our contractors. Can you help us out? Well, at be it at the Berkeley Computer Science Research Group, CSRG, was Kirk McCusick and Bill Joy. These are very smart people, and a few things came out of that, including, but not limited to, an open source TCP impl TCPIP implementation. There were various commercial ones with various vendors, but a funny thing happens with open standards. If there's like an easy way to implement them, things happen like the internet as we know it. And the first permissive licensing, I believe long prior to, uh, Stallman was pretty early with his work at, with GNU and such, but they thought, well, at one end is copy left, at the other one is copy right, we like copy center, go down to the copy center and make all the copies you want. Thank you, Kirk, for that quotation. And in removing AT&T code from the Berkeley work that they did, they did it over the internet. And who in this room does collaborative work over the internet on open source software? They pioneered that out of circumstance of trying to not get their behind sued off. Containment, Unix had the true root call, which makes a little synthetic root environment so you can like build or release. And that's nice, and that's great. You can do useful stuff. I believe it was Bill Joy who thought, well, what if we prevent applications from jumping out of it? What if we contain them? And that well, one thing led to another, and that became, say, jail on FreeBSD in 2000, which is, oh, docker stuff a decade before Docker or longer, Beehive Hypervisor, and a just lineage of containment. Anyone heard of Docker? <laughs> Anyone heard of jails, LXC? All this stuff was in various forms available, and all the, the fundamental infrastructure just came out of that same effort. So the BSD project was the de-Unixification of Unix. It was like, well, let's make it shareable. Let's get out the copywritten AT&T code, AT&T copywritten code. And out of that came an attempt to commercialize the BSDI, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, and all the modern BSDs. You've probably heard of some of those, and that probably got you down here because, hey, the title includes BSD, but in modern practicality, it's a great many different operating systems, some of which are a few degrees of separation from one another, some of which are completely different, and that's fine. And out of BSDI eventually came IX Systems, a company I worked very closely with, and they thought 20 years ago, wow, maybe we'll have like free operating systems on servers. <laughs> and then the cloud came, and finally it's like, oh, we're right, <laughs> cool. And also out of it, I mentioned Bill Joy, he went on to found Sun Microsystems. <laughs> And they did their own approach to removing the AT&T copyrights. They thought, well, let's do everything different. And has anyone worked with Solaris in any way, shape, or form? And it's like, everything's different. The tar is different. Everything's different. So it's different. And out of that work, based on, say, Kirk McCusick's work on the fast file system, uh, that was his thing. He did file systems. And back at Berkeley, they came up with the basically model for every modern file system at the time, which was then, I'd say, all the UFSs, EXTs, XFS, MTFS, everything that's overwriting and occasionally journaled. He pioneered most of that, and that's like one key person with others. And out of Sun, which came out of there, came ZFS, a complete rethink of file systems, and we'll get to that. And I consider these primary technologies, and there's an article I believe from Information Week about the greatest software ever written, and that's about BSD 4.3. There's no other small group of people who produced more technologies than more people use to this day. So, by contrast, what is GNU Linux? GNU is not Unix. I'm focusing on Unix today, and I snarkily had 
Linux, GNU Linux is a revolution, and you can define that however you please. So you probably have your own definition of it. Great, that will apply to this. So the similarities between the two. We're talking POSIX environments. We're talking Unixy environments, some of which have very subtle differences, some dramatic differences. And now, thanks to System D, we have these crazy differences between the two. We have all the standard tens of thousands of third-party applications, be it your LAMP stack, be it your Ruby stuff, be it your desktop environment of choice. All that stuff, it's available on all these different operating systems I'll talk about today. All your familiar programming languages. If you're a COBOL, open COBOL developer and views the same open implementation forever, it's probably there. If you're doing Haskell, great. If you're doing Ruby, great. It's all there. Go. It's there. It's just Unixy stuff. It's not a OS-specific thing. So anything that's generally cross-platform, it's there. In practice, in 2016 and recent years, BSD, which literally refers to Berkeley Software Distribution, comes in the form of FreeBSD, PCBSD, which are quite related, OpenBSD, NetBSD, FreeNAS, PFSense, and a zillion variations on those. FreeBSD and PCBSD. I have some disks in front if you want to grab some. General purpose operating systems, epic internet hosting, and feature rich. I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to capture a great many things in like three points. So General purpose, desktop, router, firewall, laptop, not phones, because no one's really jumped on that, but you'd think for licensing reasons they might want to do that. Who remembers ftp.cdrom.com? The highest traffic site back in the 90s. It's just a little FreeBSD box, but not packets. And who's heard of Netflix? Anyone? <laughs> They're pumping out a third of US internet traffic using FreeBSD. It's really good at networking, among other things. OpenBSD? Also general purpose, works fantastic on a laptop because all the developers aggressively dog food on ThinkPads and they've got their own ACPI suspend and resume stack, which gee, there's Intel's Microsoft's. Wow, that's, that's pretty impressive. They've done some amazing things. Any open SSH users in the room? Yeah, well, that's out of them. <laughs> Thank them, they are pretty darn cool in that regard. Epic security features, they focused on security very early on. Memory randomization, randomization is just about everything for security purposes. Very impressive, but simultaneously a very good development environment. They aggressively dog food. You can live in OpenBSD. I'll get into a touch more depth later, but uh, I consider OpenBSD the purest of the Unix traditions. They replace software with new smaller software because wow if all the users generally for example httpd they now have their own web daemon most users do some really basic web work and all that stuff that apache does doesn't apply apply to most users so what if we strip it to its bare minimum essentials you get like occam's os <laughs> so good stuff there um, NetBSD, we do have one of the first five developers, contributors in the room, and I appreciate that, Phil. Uh, I'll say semi-general purpose. It, you'll, you'll probably find that, wow, it doesn't work with my laptop or maybe a little behind on, say, all the desktop functionality you may want, but it is epically portable. The joke is that it runs on a toaster, but toasters don't have CPUs, but actually Internet of Things, they are starting to, which is a bit scary. <laughs> so it's famous for portability. Very clean and simple. Yes, sir. They actually did build a toaster. They did build a toaster? Okay, cool. <laughs> you can see it on the internet. So do check out the toaster. And very big in Japan. I just returned from Asia BSD Con and they have a table just overflowing with devices supported with it. Yes, sir. Welcome. So elegant. It's it uh, try it out. It's it's quite clean and simple and refreshing in many regards, and also a very authentic Unix tradition right there. FreeNAS, I also have just to that up front, <clears throat> the world's most popular hardware agnostic software defined storage slash NAS system slash sound. This is based on FreeBSD. It has about eight and a half million downloads, and you name it for uh, open source, free software or proprietary vendors of software defined storage, I think that it blows them out of the water in, in usability and use and, in, and reach. I've talked to analysts in the industry 
and they use free NAS to test other NAS systems in their labs. <laughs> yes, okay, it's, it's the de facto standard in that space, and we'll get to some of those advantages. PF Sense, the router firewall running this event. Who's used the internet at this event? Is it working? Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's uh, just had a release. <coughs> I believe it's now based on FreeBSD 10.3, the latest release of them. A pretty user interface for all the routing and firewall and VPNing and networky stuff you want to do. What's that? They just redid it all. They just redid it all. Apparently a completely new interface. It was getting kind of clunky PHP kind of old and it's now been refreshed. I should have a screenshot up there. Go check it out. Very useful. And these last two, FreeNAS and PFSense, I will argue they are the greatest gateway drug killer apps that open source has produced because they're ultimately useful to Windows users, Mac users, virtualization users, ESXi users with an iSCSI share, etc. Things where your user has no idea what's behind the scenes and it doesn't matter. That was one of the great first killer apps around 95 with Linux. With Samba, users could print once again. It's like, yes! Windows 95 and Linux, like breakthrough. It's like, oh, it works, great. And you just kind of chuckle because back then it was pretty early up and coming technology. So uh, that's PFSense. And <clears throat> as promised, going a little deeper on OpenBSD. If you are on a desert island and you're like, wanting to get it online, you've got your own top level domain, and you need to get that desert island online, the OpenBSD distribution set literally has everything you need from BGP routing, from the name services, to web services, to the works. And the base OS is still like, I think, 200 uh, megs, it's pretty tiny. And it's funny, when you just strip things down to their bare essentials, you get security, you get just basic functionality and um, immense reliability. Again, they focus on security. <clears throat> Again, <coughs> open SSH users. I love when <coughs> gung-ho Linux people assume that open SSH is a GNU project. <laughs> it is not, it's out of OpenBSD and it's at openssh.org. Also from them is packet filter. So PFSense, uh, has PF in its name, that's referring to packet filter. And the FreeBSD and OpenBSD packet filters have diverged a little bit. They were, you know, imported long ago and they've had different little features added, but for those using IP tables, that's what you want to use, and I'll touch on that a little later. It's the human readable syntax firewall. <laughs> Who in the room's a human? <laughs> you want that. Back to FreeBSD, PCBSD, and FreeNAS. It's a great overall Unix environment. I latched onto it, oh gosh, 2000 something, five-ish. I thought, wow, finally, finally a scrappy, great little Unix environment. Which gets back to your point about uh, Unix and BSD early on. So I had been shopping for a Unix after college. It's like, hey, I want that thing we had in the basement bunker there. So I tried Coherent. Who remembers Mark Williams' company, Coherent? It was a, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yep, a, a Unix, either license clone, I couldn't quite tell, but it worked great on 386. I looked at Red Hat 5.1. The documentation didn't match the OS. But that's, come on, <laughs> even I'm catching bugs like that. But <clears throat> 5.2 was quite cool. It was a great scrappy little Unix clone. I thought, yes, I found it. I've been looking in Portland where I'm at is a red hat town. Torvalds is now there. Great. And shortly thereafter came Red Hat 6. And this scrappy little Unix clone with now GNOME became a stunningly crappy Windows clone. <laughs> like, oh, downhill for years until in the last talk I saw someone swiping on Ubuntu on their touch screen. It's like, great. We finally got that all to work. But in those middle years, it sucked. So, open ZFS. Who has heard of ZFS? Anyone, anyone. Okay, we'll touch on that. If we're to talk killer apps, it's a killer app. And Beehive Hypervisor, who's heard of that? Yeah, get yeah, Beehive. Cool. <laughs> I've been very involved in that. It's a bare metal hypervisor that uses the 
on CPU acceleration features found in modern CPUs, like the core ser series from Intel, so Core i7, i5, I, you name it, and the equivalent Xeons. By letting the CPU do the hard part, which, you know, they finally brought all that in. I think AMD pioneered that with SVM, I think they called it. Ah, the hypervisor itself is tiny. It's really, really tiny. It's like at one point, like 256 kilobytes of code to do everything it does, all the management, because it's all offloaded to the CPU to do the hard part. Instead of the good old days where it's like Zen and all the memory management handled in like software and BIOS and software and all these goodies and software. So I consider it like modern virtualization. So open CFS. It is an always consistent on-disk file system. It is continuously checking your data integrity. That means it's a checksumming data as it's written down. It verifies that when it's uh, requested, and it will not give you bad data if encountered. It is mildly terrifying to think about all those disks with file systems out there that are not checking all that. I own many of them, and let's hope your data is in good shape. There is no way of knowing what shape it's in until you actually use it, and even then stuff might be acceptable as a, a bit error. So that's a key distinction in the generations. If Kirk gave us fast file system back in the day, that was like revolutionary. Well, nowadays you can do things like, say, in CPU compression and the checksumming and deduplication, other neat things. So <clears throat> it is also an unlimited snapshotting file system such that you can snapshot uh, snapshot the state of the file system at any given time and any changes are added on top of that and you can roll back to that point in time. Fantastic for crypto locker attacks. I have an article out there and you're welcome to check out. You can then say, oh well that was a great moment in time. Let's make a copy of that. And so it makes a zero overhead copy of that same state in time because it just says, well let's aim at that. So only changes are added on top of that. It includes an integrated RAID volume manager I refer to it as re redundancy because RAID has so much baggage as a term that I try not to get people hung up on it, but the equivalent of RAID, using the snapshot mechanism it will replicate between additional systems or local systems. It allows for hybrid uh, SSD and HDD tiering, meaning that, well, SSDs are really fast. Let's put our writes there, nice safely on an SSD, and then shuffle them off to the rest of the store uh, when the time comes. And also, wow, memory is really quick, but it's easy to run out of, so let's have an SSD from which we have a read cache and we pull data in from when the user requests it. It's really fast as if everything was flash. That's cool. <clears throat> and boot environments. Who's tried Grub for multi-booting stuff? Anyone? Anyone? Show of hands. <laughs> Who enjoyed using Grub to multi-boot stuff? I get a shaky hands, a few shakes. Yeah, it's like that's how it's done and it boots if you're lucky. So, boot environments. Fundamental to a Unix system is the root, which is like, hey, here's all this top level stuff and below that the rest of your, your files, your data, your applications, everything. Well, ZFS is almost like a, a, a lower level be below the POSIX file system uh, goodies. So a boot environment is a choice of roots. And at boot time, you can pick one. All in the same pool is what they call a ZFS storage system. And so as a parlor trick, I took my laptop and I installed FreeBSD Current, which is a development branch in a boot environment, and FreeBSD Stable in a boot environment, and FreeNAS 9 in a boot environment, and 10 in a boot environment. And at boot time, you hop between them all in the same actual file system. It is like an integrated multi-boot rather than, gosh, I hope it works. And the there, there's experimental use of the FreeBSD loader to boot Illumos in the form of Open e Indiana. Illumos is a continuation of Open Solaris, which was a continuation of Sun Solaris back when it was open source before Oracle did bad things. Well, without much too much trouble, <coughs> we should be able to have a ZFS file system in which you choose between Illumos, FreeNAS, PFSense, and we essentially blow up multi-booting with a big bomb and it's gone forever. And yay. So 
We'll get into legal things relating to Linux and ZFS a little later, but I want to cover some of these hot features. It is a cross-platform file system. Can, what, what would we consider the number one other cross-platform file systems? FAT32. Great. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Snapshotting. Are you joking? De data integrity checking. No large disks? Hell no. So, yeah, it's sad, but that's, you know, we've had such OS-specific file systems, which is sad. But wait, there's ButterFS. Oh, my gosh. Yay. So I've been doing some research for months, and it's kind of sad because, wow, ButterFS. They put a volume manager under a file system. Well, you really need to start with the volume manager because now they're finding that, say, the multi various levels of redundancy are kind of hard. Well, yes, it's really hard. You need really smart people to do it. I'm sure they're really smart, but it's really hard, and you'll find various complaints about that. It is still very Linuxy. It has an FS tab. I never want to see an FS tab again. That's a little file system tab. Uh, so it says, oh, well, you, you, if you don't mention the FS tab that your ButterFS file system is compressed, it's like, oh, my gosh, it's all corrupt. It's like, oh, my God. Well, oh, it's compressed. Okay, let me tell it it's compressed. It doesn't know that. And, oh, it's great, fine, great. <laughs> Yay. So uh, strong license obligations. Hey, it's, it's a GPL license. And so it will perhaps be the de facto GNU Linux file system several years from now once it's truly proven. And, well, there are many other operating systems out there, such as aforementioned ones in BSD. And it's not cross-platform. And cross-platform is awesome. I've been using ZFS on my Mac through a little piece of third-party software for like two years now, and I can verify the integrity of my data. What a concept. <coughs> In the proprietary world, there's Waffle from NetApp. None of us can afford to license it, and I don't think it's available for licensing. So it's like a non-starter on a fancy file system from them. I can't tell what EMC is up to. Microsoft has ReFS as their ZFS killer. I don't think it's even used as a default on Microsoft storage products. You'd think it would, but apparently it's really slow, and Great. It's not like we can have it on our, our GNU Linux or BSD laptops. Who's heard of Bcache? So going deep catalog here, the Bcache people have a nifty way of putting like SSD read cache and write cache devices in front of, say, ext2. It's like, okay, that's cool, kind of ZFS-ish. And they're talking about a file system of their own. And it's out there in alpha status and Give it a try, and maybe in a few years, like 5 to 10, which is normal for file systems to get trusted, maybe that's an option. But in my research, we're out of choices. And I would really love if you surprised me with some amazing file system that's taken all those precautions, has a great license, is proven, and great, but I can't find it. So to the comparisons, FreeBSD, OpenBSD versus GNU Linux. Again, packet filter, if you're doing networking. It's the human readable syntax for networking. As I recall in IP tables, there's like a separate syntax for IPv4 and 6. You gotta maintain everything in duplicate. It's like, oh, it's, come on, it's easier. Just save yourself the trouble. So, to get to your other question. At the Friday event, someone cornered me and talked about, hey, you know, the, the memory manager on FreeBSD is pretty darn cool. There is Linux binary compatibility. Well, when you have a better memory manager, your wow. games run faster. And you get to frag more people <laughs> more fragalistically. So running Steam on, say, PCBSD can be a really good gaming experience, even though it's not really Linux, but it's just compatibility. On a similar note, a high frequency trader was using the Beehive hypervisor to run Linux and Linux was running with about 30% lower latency. That's money to them. I can't even make use of that, but that for them it's like big dollars when the kernel's not saying, oh hello USB interface, oh hello all these subsystems. <laughs> it's like, no, let's just only run the stuff we need to and you've probably noticed in supercomputing it's like 98.8% a new Linux kernel, you strip out everything, make it go fast, and great. 
my one bit of trolling. So to move from GNU Linux to FreeBSD, just do a ZFS send of your data from one pool to the other and you're done. Thank you. <laughs> but no, OpenZFS is quite uh, new to GNU Linux and we'll talk about the implications there. But in all practicality, there is reasonable good support for EXT2, I believe three, and I think four is actually journaling on top and you can, you can mount it as a previous version and other goodies. There's reasonable support in various BSDs. So if you have a disk, you can probably mount it and copy out your data, which is at least some practicality about the migration process. So uh, going from GNU Linux to FreeBSD, there is no ButterFS support or XFS support. So if you're using an exotic Linux, GNU Linux file system, then you'll have to like copy your data over the network. Yes, we have KDE, XFCE, and in fact recently Illumina desktop out of PCBSD, which is a very lightweight but attractive as opposed to Jurassic looking desktop that has very few dependencies. It is nicely licensed. It is not relying on massive libraries from here and there. So I welcome you to check that out on uh, PCBSD. For those familiar with RPM and dpackage and all the goodies apt and such, we have package, PKG, which on FreeBSD replaces all the legacy various ways to do systems. Stepping back, there's something on all the BSDs called the ports collection, a NetBSD that reflects uh, ports to different operating uh, platforms, source. but what's that? Package source. Package source. So yes. On NetBSD, package source for the software, ports for the architectures, but on OpenBSD and FreeBSD, ports are ported software, just to get the terminology right. So uh, a port is a lot like on a GNU Linux system where you have a, here you download a patchy, you have your local patches, you RPMify it, and it's all the behind the scenes software that gets built. Well, for the average user, package installs binaries of all that software. So the hard work is done behind the scenes and then you do package search XFCE, which is a desktop I've been using, and package install XFCE, Firefox, LibreOffice, you name it, and it will uh, maybe at the end of that process spit out a few messages relating to each piece of software, but within a few minutes you have all those familiar things. And I just spin up machines with the same little script of packages uh, routinely, but on PCBSD they've even made that simpler with click, click, next, next, finish, and very user friendly. So next, 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 finish, use PCBSD. It makes that yet easier. <clears throat> PCBSD, and again I have disks up in front if you like. Uh, all the things, OpenZFS, there are two tier one OpenZFS platforms, Illumos and FreeBSD, although there is no true I get into trouble with this. I, and they don't like hearing it, but there is no true Illumos. You download a Lumos, a Lumos distribution variation like you do with Linux. You don't just grab a Smart canonical OS. one. What's that? Smart OS or somebody. Smart OS, Open Indiana, Omni IT OS, and all that. It's like, well, can I just download the real one? It's like, no, 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 no. And they're like, yeah. Anyway, so. FreeBSD is a tier one OpenZFS platform. It's included out of the box and there's only one FreeBSD rather than variations on it, short of the downstream variations. So recently, a lot of focus has been placed on security and privacy. So PersonaCrypt encrypts files at a file level so that if in a given directory, it all looks like garbage until you give it a key. And Geli, which is full block level disk level encryption which is also available on FreeNAS such that the entire block device is encrypted and without the proper key it looks like absolute garbage. There are stealth sessions which is hey I will log in it will create a CFS data set for the user the user will do their web surfing as anonymously as possible and when you log out it destroys it all. So i uh, thinking about the modern era there and a pleasant surprise. Okay, who's heard of LibreSSL? Okay, so was it Heartbleed that really pointed out that the SSL folks have been kind of lazy on a lot of fronts? And the OpenBSD folks who admitted that, and talked to individuals, that no one really wanted to look into 
open SSL, despite the fact that they rely on it heavily and they knew there would be dragons. Push came to shove, <clears throat> and they finally took a close look at it and found that, for example, oh, there aren't a whole lot of people with next step 68K system so you can probably safely delete that and no one will notice and that's just one example of countless examples where <coughs> they found you can strip out epic amounts of open ssl to produce what they're calling libre ssl or lib re ssl to play off of that because libre is generally used for copyleft things and they're, they're kind of tongue-in-cheek there and PCBSD has been working with LibreSSL such that all of its third-party packages, ports, and goodies, all the software you add to it, are depending on that. So it's a safer SSL, and if anything, they're doing the hard work to make sure that all that common software is compatible with LibreSSL. It's a good thing. So pitfalls, I saw that in Larry's description of this talk. Um, I don't know, you'll have to ask Larry because uh, it's working for me. I, I don't know. So food for thought. So Ubuntu BSD was announced quite recently. Kind of out of nowhere. <laughs> really out of nowhere. And shortly after, Canonical proudly said that the next Ubuntu will include OpenZFS. And a great many people were upset, like the Free Software Foundation and the Software Freedom Conservancy, saying you can't do that. That's when you ship a kernel with an incompatible license, it's a derivative work. And we've said for decades, you can't do that. <laughs> so, Canonical is pushing forward with that. And there are various opinions out there and, and awkward legal interpretations saying, well, you know, maybe, kind of, sort of, yes, sir. Is Canonical using System D or not? No, they're using Upstart. Okay, because it was Upstart at one point. They switched. Okay, well, okay, let me continue and we'll touch on that. And I, I downloaded it, but I didn't have a chance to install it. I was hoping in all that free time during the conference. Okay, so Ubuntu 16.04 has just arrived. Apparently it was ZFS. Well, let's all give it a try. And System D. Interesting. And then shortly after, all these essential organizations in the community saying, you can't do that, Ubuntu BSD came out of the woodwork. And it's like, oh, it's a bunch of, it's seemingly volunteers, even though, wow, it's working remarkably efficiently as if, gee, there's a really big puppet behind it making it happen, and they're hedging their bets on OpenZFS. And keep in mind, Ubuntu's always been proudly Ubuntu. I have, haven't seen the words Ubuntu and Linux combined for a very long time. It's like, we're Ubuntu. So it is Ubuntu plus FreeBSD, which brings them OpenZFS with zero strings attached. I tried it not too long ago. It has grub. And you'll see a Twitter conversation going on right now about you're doing it wrong. The FreeBSD loader is your friend. It's really simple. Boot environments, if anything, please. And they're like, well, where's the package? It's, it's fundamental. If you have to package it, fine. But hopefully they'll move to the proper loader soon because, oh, the complexity of Grub is astounding, especially to load FreeBSD, which has all these special flags and goodies and K FreeBSD, they call it. So. If it includes Grub and perhaps System D, it's like, wow, you've gone to a great amount of trouble to simply get ZFS. And if you're so yeah, proud of System D. Ubuntu BSD does not include System D. It does not. Okay, so let's. Okay, so Ubuntu with it at the moment, this without. Maybe this is their uh, Mia Culpa edition? <laughs> I don't know. So watch this space. It is fascinating because none of us saw it coming. There are a lot of us who are working closely with developers on all this stuff, and it's like, what? Oh, what? <laughs> so, check that out. They probably want to change the name, though. Canonical probably doesn't like having Ubuntu in the name. 
or BSD. You're breaking two copyrights at once. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> so, and the logos are like a free BSD logo, <laughs> ZFS. That's like, stop. That's not how you do it. So, some quotations that people reminded me of that really should be in this talk, but I've only had 24 hours to work on this talk. So, uh, two things. Uh, back pretty far, it was Forbes or Business 2.0 or some mainstream business magazine talking to Theo Durat, the uh, simultaneous co-founder of NetBSD and OpenBSD. He left that crowd when they had a disagreement. He pointed out that whereas at the time especially these fiery Linux users were Windows haters, whereas we a little less fiery BSD people were Unix lovers. And love and hate are very different motivations. And someone brought up the BSD lawsuit. Well, in all the course of all that at and stuff I pointed at, at and and USL Labs and all these folks got upset with the fact that BSDI, predecessor to IX Systems, went as far as having a stupid phone number that said 1-800-ITS-UNIX. It's like, well, <laughs> we're talking copyright here. You, you don't do that. So there was a big stinky lawsuit that that brought BSD out of the forefront for a while while they all figured out what the heck is going on. And some of that resurfaced with SEO and bizarre attempts to argue that I think even the like the Berkeley components were really on their side. And it was just bizarre, awful stuff. And then the timing was perfect for GNU Linux. It's like, yes, we have the answer. Come on down. And well, that's why this conference is uh, Linux Fest Northwest, not maybe POSIX Systems Northwest or something catchy like <laughs> all that. But there's an extremely strong community of BSD cons around the world. There is the big one coming up in Ottawa, BSD CAN. It is now in June. There is Euro BSD con in various cities in Europe. It's m migrating around uh, next uh, this year in Belgrade, I believe. There is Asia BSD Con in Tokyo, which took place a few weeks ago, hence my coughing up here. And then there are various uh, events that take place periodically, like every other year, Meet BSD in California and VBSD Con in, uh, in uh, the, the DC area. That's all kind of a weird type book kind of blur. Uh, so do get out to whatever event you can. Uh, there are communities around the world, little local bugs and such. There are at least two prominent podcasts now, arguably three. There is the classic BSD podcast, BSD Talk, which has been at it for a very, very long time with the wonderful Will Backman. He's just covered some fantastic talks, and he doesn't have time to do it as often. So more recently, from Jupiter Broadcasting, was exhibiting down below during this conference, is BSD Now with Alan Jude and Chris Moore. Chris Moore does BCBSD. Alan does a great many things. And it was also on TechSnap from Jupiter Broadcasting, which is a really good podcast. So that is hands down the place to get up-to-date information on the BSDs and ideas and tips. And when they hear of something cool, they actually investigate it a little, which is really useful for us other busy people because it's like, oh, okay, they made a decision, a preliminary one, and I can help do the same rather than, oh, okay, another thing to go look at and all that. So there's also Garbage FM, which is a, Open BSD ish podcast that's not about Open BSD, but it is <laughs> for the most part. So that's an interesting little one that's come along. And a very quick plug the folks at IX Systems have been building BSD powered systems for 20 years and they're really, really good at it. And the FreeNAS Mini is, is a very impressive little machine for running FreeNAS in an office or home or you name it. And they've just introduced the Mini XL, which is an 8 bay machine that I really want because you can do a lot with eight bays and mm, <laughs> it's a very nice piece of equipment up through data center, epic servers. So, questions. Additional questions having fielded a few in the front and tried, hopefully slipped them in quite effectively. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, before you started I mentioned Flash. What yes. What else doesn't, you know, that we commonly are used to using on Linux that is just not BSD compatible? And I was surprised to see you mention Steam. Where I did, 
that was a surprise to me. I'm not a gamer. Steam's working. So the question is other things that aren't working. Skype has had its brief moments of working and then not working, and it's changed. It's a moving target. Yes, sir? Skype is a pain on, on Linux. Too. <laughs> no surprise. Microsoft stopped developing, stopped producing uh, updates for it about three, four years ago, and even then it was... Okay, and I think it was Linux version of Skype on BSD, which is like just asking for trouble. <laughs> Fortunately, we're th seeing things like Rocket Chat, which is taking on Slack, which is taking on Skype, and I'm surprised. Who remembers, uh, was it CUC Me or whatever that kind of the real audio era of it? Like, wow, over the internet calling is almost here. It's been almost here for like 20 years. Right. So, yes, that is, Flash can be a headache on any platform. Things like Skype. Um, Silverlight. I didn't even know there was a BSD version of Silverlight. Well, I, don't, I didn't know either. Oh, I mean, I, the, with the, the, Linux, the, the Linux version of it. Really? It's got a so, little passive-aggressive bomb or two. These are all arguments to just ditch those painful proprietary pieces of software and go help the project that's hopefully exhibiting down at the expo hall because it's if they're problematic on proprietary OSs, they're even worse on non-proprietary ones. So thinking through the list of challenges, like... People still want Microsoft Office, and there was a brief time that Code Weavers had a version for FreeBSD, and they really tried to reach out, but unfortunately it came before things like PCBSD, and they just pulled support for it because, wow, there wasn't enough demand. Uh, Bill Wright, organizer of this event, says that he's relying on, say, Office 10 and Code Weavers, and it works great. Hallelujah. I personally use this silly... Uh, Silly Mac for Office when people need real Office and Adobe products. Sorry, GIMP and Photoshop are very, very different things. There is no relationship whatsoever. And I love the Inkscape people. I've I've raised money for Inkscape. I've added features for prof for professional use to Inkscape, but it is nothing like Illustrator. And that's me even saying I hate Illustrator because I wanted freehand, which was even better for what I do. So it's uh, tricky, and it's a shame that. So many early applications were bad clones of 90s desktop apps. It's like, well, what if we step back and think in a Unixy way rather than a really crappy Office clone, a real crappy Illustrator clone, a real crappy Photoshop clone? And <laughs> so, <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, you use the term FreeBSD and PCBSD. What's the difference and what's the relationship between them? Okay, and it's even further complicated with TrueOS. So, PCBSD, which I do have discs for up front. <coughs> It is the closest to a, a Linux distro for FreeBSD, where they've gone with graphical everything. Graphical installer, graphical package manager, all your familiar apps available right out of the gate, and it's focusing on user friendliness. Under the hood, they like to call it TrueOS, which is FreeBSD with Bash, for those who absolutely must have Bash and <laughs> find that comforting. So it is strictly a user-friendly version of FreeBSD, I believe it does not vary any from underlying FreeBSD. In theory, you could remove it, and it'll you'll have a FreeBSD system. Uh, FreeNAS has been tweaked a little under the hood to keep it uh, optimized for that purpose. Um, I had another little point there, but they because they got the basics working, they're now focusing on the privacy, encryption, and other <laughs> neat things. Uh, that Lumina desktop I mentioned came out of uh, PCBSD. And while they're focusing on Lumina originally on KDE, uh, I told Chris long ago, look, you can lose the desktop battle before you play it. What? KDE versus GNOME versus Rat Poison versus uh, XFCE versus Mate versus OpenStep or AfterStep versus all these things. So. There was a point there you could install them all at installation time and pick them at login times, like after step. I've heard of it. That's the next D one, right? Let me try it. And it would just be pre-installed and working. Very, very cool. So I don't even know of a Linux distribution, a new Linux distribution, that covers desktops that well. Yes, sir? How about Wayland? How's that going? <clears throat> That's the X replacement, right? Yeah. You tell me. I heard it recently managed on a podcast. That the question is Wayland. 
I think it's having enough issues in GNU Linux space, and we, I will admit there over the years have been enough issues with X org support on non GNU Linux platforms, or especially GNOME support, where they just add stuff. But there has been some very good GNOME support. But Wayland uh, hasn't been an issue. It's more of a traditional environment with X org, and that's just fine for us. Do you have any insights on Wayland? Are you using it? Uh, no, I'm still sticking with, with X because one, I happen to really like uh, network transparency, even though some people say, oh, that's all trash. Well, now uh, Wayland, see, someone has some patches for Wayland that adds uh, network transparency to the whole mix. Okay. And I don't know if it's been pulled into the mainstream or whatever, but uh, that. Okay, so adding the network transparency back to Wayland, so it's more like XORG. Okay, fine. No, they're, they're, they're actually doing, doing it sensibly. Okay, that's cool. From what I've heard, uh, the BSD people I've talked to, they're waiting to see how it goes. Fair enough. Linux first before Wait and they see. decide what they're going to do. I would hope the Wayland people are taking non-good new Linux operating systems into consideration when they're developing it. Because yeah. when you do that, great things happen. If you don't, Everyone else gets kind of miffed. Other questions? Yes, sir. A question about ZFS. I've heard that sometimes there might be a problem if you want to expand your storage later to add another drive. Is that a problem? The problems in the planning. Exactly. So if you so. start with one drive and next one's <coughs> too small, I'll a second. Yeah. ZFS planning, I'll talk on that briefly. Uh, whew, okay. One, I hear the complaint that, oh, on ZFS you can't shrink a volume. It's like, why that? I, I, who in this room has shrunk a volume? Whose data has gotten smaller? Great, okay, four people, fine, that's cool. I wish I was in your position. So, looking ahead to bigger, ZFS includes, and OpenZFS obviously, includes two fundamental expansion, well, two fundamental redundancy strategies, mirroring and distributed parity RAID Z. Mirroring is you take two disks, they are identical to one another and protecting your data by being identical. And to that, you add additional two or more disk pairs. I've seen people do triple deep. And you can add additional two disk pairs as far as your hardware will support it. OpenZFS is a scale up system. So RAID Z distributes parity. Like the good old days on RAID, I touched on this real early on where you had a parity disk. Well, no, now parity's across them and you can have three levels of parity, so you can lose one disk, two disk, or three, depending on the configuration. And you can, uh, for any three or more disks or devices can be used for that RAID Z. So let's just say hypothetically you do six disks, eight disks on your mini XL. Great, so there's your pool. And with those, you can either do it in two pairs of RAID Z1 and it would be RAID Z1 plus RAID Z1. They are striped together, which adds some performance because they both act like two top-level devices. But if you get a bigger 16-bay chassis, you can add an additional four disks for that RAID Z, an additional four, and grow it within the confines of the RAID Z level you chose. If you start with six disks to RAID Z, add six more to that six more, and that's how they get up to petabytes of storage. You will bump into all these formulas about the number of disks and the RAID Z level and all that. And not too long ago, they added LZ4 compression, which is really efficient, which creates variable block sizes. And all that goes out the window. And there's a fantastic article by Matt Ahrens, one of the co-developers, about a play on Dr. Strange Love of why I learned to stop worrying and like RAID Z because you're fine. So if you throw, I, you don't want to get too high on that number of disks. Like nine is generally how many per RAID parity RAID set. But you can do nine, 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 nine. Now there's one more growth trick that's really, really cool. ZFS is a pool of blocks. It's looking at this pool of whatever is available. So if you have a nice simple four disk pool and say RAID Z, so you can lose a device, you can remove a device as if it failed, replace it with a larger device, what they call rebuild or resilver it to reintegrate it. You can do it with the next one, the next one, and finally the next one. 
the moment you completely reintegrate the fourth device, you have the greater capacity provided by the bigger disks. So on your little four bay system, if you go from say two terabyte disks to six terabyte disks, you just rebuild them individually. And a few points to beat up on old classic RAID there. So there is a, 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 an accusation out there that ZFS is violating the layering of classic file systems where you have the block device and the file system on top and all that noise. Well, ZFS is a pool of blocks and on those blocks are your data. So if you have an array of say eight terabytes total capacity and 500 megs of data and you replace a disk, in good old RAID terminology, you replace each disk from block zero to block one billion, linearly. It has no idea what's in there. It just says, okay, I'm gonna rebuild this. Whereas in ZFS, as a pool of blocks, it says, okay, we have a new member of the pool. Let's put the blocks on it that belong on it. So it's a fraction of the 500, 500 like megs out of a total capacity of what, eight terabytes or whatever. And gee, you, you rebuild exactly what you have and need rather than just a blunt instrument, you know, linear rebuild. Uh, I, I, I've worked with ZFS in the field for three years now, so I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'll leave you with at least one thing on OpenZFS. Don't run out and buy the most expensive hardware you can, especially a hardware RAID card. One, logically, you always think more is better, so people buy a really expensive, like, RAID card. Well, <clears throat> a RAID card does some pretty key bad things. One, the RAID card provides one single virtual device, a nice preservation of those layers. Well, ZFS doesn't think that way. It wants to talk directly to individual disks, and on top of that, a RAID card can have a write cache, and ZFS is really tight-assed. It wants to know exactly what's going on, and it's doing that to protect your data. If it's lied to by a write cache that says, yeah, it's on disk, well, you can see your data vanish because ZFS is assuming it's on disk when you tell it it's on disk. So disable any write caches you have. A great many RAID cards will mask smart data. Like, wow, what, how many hours on this disk? Is it in good health? Well, the card will often mask that and not tell you. Maybe if you're lucky, there's a special little flag that will tell you or in the BIOS. Forget that. You want a quote unquote dumb JBOD controller and talk to the disk because ZFS will do the right thing. Don't create a pool with zero redundancy. FreeNAS will let you do that, and only when it's too late will you realize, huh, I didn't back it up, and I don't have any redundancy, and oh, I lost a disk, and I lost my data. And it's like, well, redundancy is important. No NAS is a backup. It is just a place to store stuff. And if the meteorite hits that, well, there goes the meteorite and your data. Other questions? Oh, come on. Oh, yes, sir. Just five minutes left in the that's not a question. Yeah, just. <laughs> five minutes left. Okay, we can have five one minute questions. We can have. Uh, yes, sir. Can you tell me one bad thing about ZFS? Okay, excellent question. ZFS is prone to fragmentation. The only way to defrag it would be to send all data to another pool. So, also, it is a copy on, on write file system. New data goes into an available space rather than on top of other data. The good news is that. If you're interrupted copying on top of old data, you don't get a shorn write and corrupt data. But you generally want about now, in the modern era, about 20% overhead. Free space that's allocated to ZFS to do its thing. When it starts filling up, my metaphor is a hol hol holiday parking lot. You go to the convenience store or the mall, it's like on a Tuesday morning, you just park and walk in. <laughs> when it's full during the holidays, you might be circling for quite a while. And the little disk head is circling and the OS is calculating where it could or should be and finally finds a place and returns and says, oh yeah, okay, we saved it. So I'd say the fragmentation and just the, the risks if you fill it up. It's a bit draconian in its... Uh, not providing you data if it knows it's corrupt. And the warnings in the, in the utilities is like restore from backup. And most people at that point are like, <laughs> so uh, back up your pools. And it's coming from a revolutionary point of view, which is we can guarantee between systems over decades, the safety of your data. What a novel, crazy idea such that it's like, 
this was compromised in some way, don't touch it. Well, hold on, well, I'm sure some of it's okay. And I've sent people to Drive Savers who has special tools and techniques that none of us have for recovering from ZFS pools. So that's a spendy process to get your data back if you screw up. In every case, it was user error that I've seen for data loss on ZFS. ZFS is doing the right thing and you can tell it to do the wrong thing or you know, accidentally delete your data. But uh, just to emphasize the whole rollback thing, uh, companies are saving their behinds from CryptoLocker by snapshotting, retaining the snapshots through the long weekend, through the holiday, long holiday. You don't want a snapshots to be expunged after like each night at midnight and then, oops, I lost the ability to go back. But I'm even experimenting with, say, Windows on the Beehive hypervisor with the storage on ZFS and constantly snapshotting it so that your Windows machine can roll right back the moment your update screws it up, your crypto locker screws it up, you name it, screws it up. So that's exciting. Last question. I'll be in front a few more minutes. I need to hit the road. I thank you very much. And I have disks in front. Uh, 